Hi, Lauren. Thanks for coming on and talking with me today. And my pleasure to be chatting with you today in conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Me too. So you have a fascinating story. To to just start from from the beginning, could you describe these experiences that, that you've been having that trace back since you've been a child where you've been seeing these these physical things that, that you describe as angels? Um, well, for me, it's normal and, and natural. I, I don't know what it's like for you not not seeing seeing the angels physically as you see me on the screen. So I would see them here in this room as physical as that. Um, I always say to everyone, you know, from the moment my eyes, when the moment I opened my eyes, I've seen angels. I didn't know they were angels. You have to remember I was an infant in a, in a cot and... Um, I saw them as clearly as my mom when she'd be at my cot or going to pick me up or whatever. And I would be trying to reach up and touch them, but I wasn't able to because, you know, when you're a tiny infant. And I suppose maybe it was about when I was, I'm roughly always guessing my age. So it was, I was walking um, and running around a little bit and it was at that time when I was playing with my little brother, who was actually older than me, but I would have always have called him my little brother in front of the fire. And we were playing with blocks my my dad had made. And we were piling the block one on top of the other. And it, it was that his hand went into mine and mine went into his and it all sparkled. And you have to remember, I was only two and a half, so... I never put two and two together in that way. But it was at that moment that the angels had said to me, I must keep it a secret. And they told me my little brother had died before I was born. You see, at times I would see him as a tiny infant in my mom's arms when she'd be asleep in front of the fire. And again, I never questioned it. And mm -hmm. I think this is why I always called him my little brother. But... He had died at 10 weeks and he was born before I was, you know, so sometimes he would even appear at roughly maybe four or five different ages, but I still always called him my little brother. So I, I hope that's a help. I, I have always mm -hmm. just seen angels. It's just normal and natural and I am severely dyslexic. So I started to understand why the angels kept reminding me um, to say nothing because I wouldn't be here talking to you. I would have, I was already as a small child and as, even as I grew, even as a teenager, even as, you know, a mother considered retarded. You know, but, but I wasn't, I'm just severely dyslexic. So... And it's just taken me years to pronounce that word dyslexic. And I think I have it right now yeah, yeah. in that, in that way. So they were always just reminding me to keep it a secret. So I never said anything to anyone at all, you know, and it was only at a time when, when I had married and before my husband Joe had died and um, when he, his health was really bad. You know, um, I helped him to see energy. And I always remember the time when we were going out together, you know, and he was sitting in the car and I sat beside him. And I just said, I have something to tell you. Dad, he just looked at me, you know, what could I have to tell him? Like, uh, God knows what he was thinking. And I, I just said, I see angels. And I always remember, you know, he holding onto the steering wheel and he looking at me and saying, only priests and nuns see angels. You know, and I just gave him a peck of the cheek and ran into the house and thought I'd never see him again. You know, but he turned up again and he, he never mentioned it. He stayed, you know. Oh, wow. You know, he never talked about it or anything like that. Just at times he would have got a bit frustrated when he saw it was having an effect on me, mm. you know, in that in that way. And then when it got closer to the time that God took him home to heaven, 
you know, oh, I could tell you many stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that one. Um, so you were getting messages to be quiet about these experiences, just out of the concerns of the way that you might be treated, you might might be considered along with with the fact that, that you were dyslexic, uh, just c concerns that that you might be. You know, especially back then, you know, put in some kind of institution or like medicated in a certain way that would have reduced or destroyed these abilities or just in a way that, that would have kept your freedom down so that you wouldn't be able to go down the path you're on now. You know, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here talking to, to you as such. So they did always remind me constantly, you know, and you know, not to say, say anything. And the angels would say to me sometimes when I would hear adults passing comment, you know, and they would say to me, they know no better. And I, I love that because even today, you know, when someone um, ridicules me in any way, or it just says, you're crazy, you're mad. And I just smile to myself and I love them. And I, I just know they know no better. Right. And and that's okay. That's that's okay. Yeah, because we that's that's such a it's it's a foreign experience to the way that most people perceive the world. So it just it just doesn't fit into the way that that we think perception would be possible. So it's yeah. it's just it, it's a it's a matter of people not having context for that kind of an experience. Yeah, and, and I suppose it is in the sense of you know. People don't understand the experience I have every single day, you know, yeah. every moment. Um, but I don't understand theirs either because you have right. to admit all one thing. I haven't been educated by the world, so I haven't been contaminated in the same way you have been. I have so been great way of putting it. educated by God and the angels. You know, I, I get so confused. I, I just say, what? I, I can't understand why mankind, why human beings do what they do. Like I, I can't, I can't understand this. To me, yeah. it's alien. Yeah. And yes, to people out there, I'm alien to them because they don't understand. But I think a lot of people are connecting more spiritually, you know, to their soul, to themselves, to the unknown in in that way, and. I just see people that of all, all walks of life, that when they start to do that, they become better. Yeah. You know, and, and that's all that matters. You know, it doesn't matter about any, anything else. Like I always remember when writing angels in my hair, I've been terrified and I couldn't write it. I had to wait for technology to come in and I had to wait my whole life. I was always saying no to God. But when technology came in, and that time Archangel Michael came up behind me when I was feeling my little daughter in the pram, and I always remember that day getting really annoyed. You know, you can imagine a young mother feeling a pram and, and stopping and just saying, go away, leave me alone, you know, I'm busy, you know, in that, in that way. And he insisted and just said, God has a message for you, and... I just remember being so annoyed and just looking at him and saying to him, I can't even read or write. How on earth does God want me to write a book? I couldn't even write my name. Like my children, I don't know how they got away with it, but they would write the letters for school. And no teacher ever questioned it. Isn't it amazing? There is a miracle. <laughs> like, it's happening. No teacher ever questioned it because it would be in their handwriting, because I couldn't do it, you know. And I just always remember that time being so, so annoyed, you know, with Archangel Michael, but even with God and saying, no, how, how, you know, I couldn't see how that's possible. Mm -hmm. But when the time came was after um, when my husband Joe went home to heaven, you know, I actually said yes. And I was terrified, you know, I, I said yes. And, and then just things started to happen, you know, uh, someone turned, I, I just said to someone I knew, um, I'm going to write. And they knew I couldn't read or write. They knew I couldn't even write my name. And they looked at me. They didn't run me down. 
you know, or anything like that. They just said, okay. And then I don't know how long afterwards they came back. It could have been months or a year later. They came back and knocked on the door. And, you know, they just said, I'm just dropping in to see how you are. And I said, well, come on in and have a cup of tea. And so they had a cup of tea and they chatted about their family. And I chatted about my children. And then it was time. They said they had to go, but they had something out in the car. You know, and this man went out to his car and he carried back in the huge box, put it on the kitchen table, went back out again and carried in another huge box and put it on the kitchen table and had a small little box on top of one of them. And he just said, there you are. That's for you. And didn't even tell me what was in the boxes and left, you know, and I remember opening them and saying, God, what are you up to? And it was a Dell laptop, you know, the real old fashioned ones, real yep. heavy, everything. It had a printer as well, because I had no money. You know, I was a widow. You, you have hardly any money. And um, there was a dragon net, the small little box had stuff for, for dragon net. Um, and then God, what would you say? Nobody knew how to set this up. So God moved me um, down here to Thomastown, to the old farmhouse. That's another real long story. But God is always optimistic. Yes. <laughs> but I love him anyway. <laughs> um, moved me down here with my little daughter um, at the time. And uh, my, what would, what would you say? I kind of, you know, the neighbours down in a country little village kind of know for somebody that has just moved in and all of that. Now, the farmhouse wasn't livable. We lived in a tent and everything in it, and there was rats in it and all that kind of thing. It's another whole story. But I said to one of the neighbours, you know, I have the laptop, and she just said, my husband knows all about that. And he came up and I told him I was dyslexic. I told him I couldn't read or write. And he set it up in a way that I only had to press two buttons. To write. To, to write, to talk into the computer for it to okay. print with the Dragonet. I have never found anyone else as skilled as he is. Because when I ever ask anyone and I say, I'm dyslexic, severely dyslexic. It's no point to show me writing on the screen or anything like that. Could you set it up in a way that it'll talk to me and, you know, do what I want it to do? Yeah. Um, but technology is not that good yet. It's right. good. It's getting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're closing in on that with, with some of the AI. It's, it's going to get really interesting. And it's it's so cool how that, how technology is able to give people opportunities to do things that, that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So we, we get some really interesting pieces of art and creations that, that w wouldn't have come about. Yeah, For, that, that, that is incredible. Like, yeah. you know, and I wouldn't have been able to write the first book angels in my hair only for technology mm -hmm. and for other people, I would say, listening to their guardian angel and listening to God and doing unusual things. You know, imagine someone buying you all that equipment and, you know, and just leaving it there. And and that was it, you know. What was it like writing that? So, so your voice dictating it into the computer and you're just kind of you're did did you have a structure of the way that you wanted to go through it chronologically or are you just kind of like reflecting on the things that are coming to mind and you're just you're just talking and and brainstorming and getting the ideas out well i i suppose another part of the story is when i said yes to god you know when i actually said yes and stopped saying no even though i still say no an awful lot um again someone gave me this little tape deck and and one evening um archangel michael just came along you know pestering me annoying me and just said you know we want you to put talk in little memories and they might be only one sentence or two sentences 
And I had about maybe six tapes of them. And then when the computer and that came along, again, another story when that was set up, um, someone else knocked on the door again and um, came in and had a cup of tea, a chat, and just said, you know, if I ever could help you in any way, let us know. You're one of your children, if one of your children need a hand. And I just said, no, I could do it a hand because I'm writing a book. So this person gave one day a month and actually typed out what was on the tapes. So then when it was emailed to the computer or whatever she did, um, I could get the computer to read, read that out loud. And then I started to talk in the story and it printed out the story. So, and then what she did afterwards, because I don't do full stops or capital letters, none yeah. of that, you know. And so she put in the full stops and the capital letters in that, in that way. So that's a real long story again. You know, it's, it's just, I suppose, the angels have been my teachers, my best friends. They have, they're everything to me. They have raised me, even though I was living with my siblings and that, but you were considered retarded. So it's like, you know, you weren't spoken to or anything like that. In that, in that way, you were just ignored. But yet all the miracles that unfolded through all my life. And I think a lot of us spiritually have to look at the miracles that unfold in our, in your life, say, or someone else's life. Sometimes we don't notice that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that, that, that you had a, a better ability to get in, in touch with different kinds of messages or insights or ways of living because of that solitude where you're not, you're not getting overwhelmed with the chatter of civilization and being socialized and you know g getting wrapped up in all of the things that little kids get wrapped up in in society you're spending a lot of time on your own what what kind of influence do you think that played i i think it played a huge inf influence because you know the angels have been my best friends and my companions and they taught me everything out in nature so even at school you were put into the back of the class right and you were you were ignored um, but they literally taught me everything, you know, how to see, how to feel, like what I tell you in the books is only a little, it's only a fraction, you know, and I, I know different religions would often come to me and say it might be an imam or, you know, a priest, it could be even a bishop, and they ask me questions, and I kind of, but don't you know that yourself? You know, I would expect them to know, haven't you been highly educated? Why are you asking me? But one question that I was asked over a number of years now, and I always remember the first time being asked it, being just so shocked. You know, a bishop has asked the same question, priests have asked, imams have asked, ministers have asked. Um, and I know there's so many other religions as well. And I was just so dumbfounded that this question came up and that they would ask. And that was, Lorna, is God real? That, that kind of shocked me, you know, because I just looked at them and said, but don't you know God is real? Why are you asking me that question? I'm afraid God is real. And I, I tell everyone, don't wait till the last moment when your life is coming to an end, your human life, to discover that. It would be great if you all could discover that beforehand. Imagine how we would all change. Right. <laughs> yeah, so for you, in thinking about God, what what is that presence like to you? What, what is the way that, that you perceive that energy? Like wh when you say God, what do you mean by that? Um, when I say God, it depends on, you know, sometimes I would just hear God's voice and God's voice is, how can I describe it? 
It always sounds very deep, but yet gentle. Um, sometimes when God appears physically, God always gives a male appearance. And I suppose that's because I was brought up Catholic, you know, in that in that way. And I, how would I say, it's it's overwhelming. I, I know if you read, um, I think it's in Stairways to Heaven, I'm not quite sure which book it's in, um, God's Library, you know, I still do the same thing today. I run and hide. And in God's library, I ran and hid behind a big book. You know, I still kind of do the, the same thing because God's presence is is so powerful that in what way you're kind of afraid, but you're excited and you want to run towards it, like you want to give yourself a moment. If you understand, give yourself a moment. It's, it's so overwhelming. It's so, it's so immense. And, yeah, and, and that love is, is just incredible, you know, and there's no way to describe it. I yeah. could use all the human words right. that you find and you'd still not describe it. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, you being brought up Catholic. What kind of influence do you think that has in the way that God appears to people? Like when, when you have your experiences and other people describe God showing up in different forms, do you think that that's... that's this this energy, this presence kind of coming in in a context-dependent way so that you're better able to understand it? Yeah, I, I definitely think that's the way God does it. Like, you know, many people would call angels by another name. You know, maybe they say it's a higher being, maybe they say yeah. it's a guide or, or different names. Um, I call them angels. You know, and there's, I know my voice is going now a little bit because I talk so much. <laughs> yeah. So so yes, if I, I I believe I believe so why why would God want to frighten us? So what we believe in or, or what religion we are from, you know, like I always remember when routing angels in my hair and just saying to God, you know, because I was so afraid of being ridiculed, you know, by Catholics themselves, you know, for not using the word Jesus. Mm. I never called God Jesus, you know, and just saying that to God that day and he's standing in my presence and, uh, you know, asking what will I call you, you know, if I, will I call you Jesus, will I call you Allah, there was a whole load of names I, I named out and God just looked at me and just said, Lorna, what do you call me? And I remember putting my hands on my hips, kind of getting really annoyed and saying, God, of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in that different way. And, and then the answer that brought me back was, you know, the word God is universal. Everyone knows who you're talking about. And I, I love that because it doesn't matter what religion you are. If you use the word God, everyone knows who you're talking about. And and God has hundreds or thousands of names. It's I I found it shocking to believe to hear all the different names. I haven't even heard them all yet, but yeah. there's thousands. Yeah. But it's God. That's who everyone is talking about. Yeah, it's, it seems like everyone's just trying to point towards the same thing and describing it in different ways. And it, it's kind of it, it's a shame when you see so much bickering and arguing over the descriptions because it seems like it's just not the point. And that it's, um, that, that part is very sad when someone's, you know, like I even get that, you know, someone giving up because I don't say Jesus all of the time, you know, yeah. I don't hear you say Jesus, it's not God, but Jesus is God. I, I, I always thought people knew that. I never realized people didn't didn't know that. Like Allah is God. It's just another name. Yeah. You know. Um and then to see you know the other part that is sad, people fighting over God in the sense and and killing each other over God. Right. When God is all about love. Yeah. You know, it's like everyone wants to live in the in the old past, in that sense, where God has always only shown me love and kindness. 
you know, and, and does so towards us all. But we do have choices. You don't have to, you know, destroy something or kill something. You know, you you, you have the choice. Yeah. And you even have the choice when it has been done to you and you want to get revenge. But you still have the choice to break that cycle and say no. And say, I'll show compassion and love instead. Yeah. And reach out to those that have hurt me. I will save them. One of the interesting things about your story and your experiences that stuck out to me is that often, you know, in, in many of these religions and religious texts, you have what's, what are often described as mystical experiences and that it's, it's something that, that pops into somebody's life. It's not normally there, but it, induced in some kind of way. Maybe it's through, maybe it's just naturally occurring. Maybe it comes through some type of like yogic technique. Maybe it comes through some, like some kind of psychedelic or something like that. But for you, it's, this thing is, is, is always there and you're always in touch with, with this source in your experiences. W what is it? Could, could you describe how these things look like to you? Like w when you're seeing something, is, is it possible or is it as ineffable as like um, the, the energy that you're getting? I, I, and I love the way you're calling it energy because we as human beings are energy as well. But we consider ourselves flesh and blood as well, and we consider ourselves spiritual as well, you know, because of our soul. Um, I see angels physically, and how would I say? They can make themselves in size of us if they want, but most of the time they're way taller and bigger than what we are. Okay, and they are a light, and it's like within this light they they give what would stop us from being afraid. You know, they give this human appearance. So I know if an angel appeared to someone that was of a different nationality and maybe different color skin than myself, an angel would appear, give that type of human appearance in that, in that way. Um, and as for energy, where will I start? And um, I'm looking out the window there at the trees and all the stuff here in the kitchen. Everything is flowing energy. And I see mm. it natural. And yeah. I, I can't understand why you can't. This is the part I can't understand. Why aren't you able to? But again, I think it's what you had said earlier on. Um, I'm not, I haven't been conditioned by the world. Yeah. Because I was severely dyslexic. And in Ireland at that time, they didn't know what that was, you have to remember. Mm -hmm. You know, so you were considered retarded. And the angels did a good job of constantly reminding me not to say anything. Mm -hmm. Because again, I would have, as you had said, I would have ended up in an institution. But I'm, I'm here and I'm able to share with the world what I see every day. It's normal. It's like even this glass of water, you know, never mind the air, you know, the, I, I see so much that I never even mention. Um, but even the glass of water to see all the, to you, a glass of water probably looks clear, but to me, a glass of water is not clear. It is full of particles and it shifts and changes all of the time. No. That I've been lately telling people that everything is translucent. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm helping people here at the sanctuary, sometimes when we do a workshop, helping them to, to see, not to look. You just look at things you don't see, you know. At, but that's the way you've been conditioned about from in the world, you know, you've been conditioned in the sense that you look around the room and you're meant to take it all in, you know, you're only lucky, you're not seeing, you're missing the detail, you're even missing that if you decide to see something and you start to see the detail, what you haven't seen before. And then it starts to become translucent. But again, you're seeing through the eyes of your soul 
and through your human eyes at the same time. I hope that's not too much. No, no, that makes sense. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because what, what's so interesting. So you're seeing reality in a way that the objects, whether it be like me or you as a person or a table or a glass of water, you're seeing everything as being dynamic instead of like these static things. Like you're, you're seeing yeah. like vibrations in them. You're seeing things kind of pulse and move around. Yeah. Every, everything is alive. You know, you have to remember we have this beautiful planet, this universe that surrounds us, the other planets mm -hmm. and everything is alive. And this beautiful planet that we have been given, I suppose when you're given something for nothing, we take it for granted and we keep right. taking it in that, in that way. So we have forgotten to allow ourselves to see, to see what's actually happening, you know, and, and I do love the way, like, in what way will I say this? I just see the air, now like even me looking now here, hey, they've probably noticed me lucky. Um, you know, I'm seeing the movement of the air and I'm seeing so much within the air itself. And back, I don't know how long ago, science suddenly said, you know, that the stardust in the air. And here I said to myself, oh, so that's what all those sparkles are, stardust. <laughs> You know, in that in that way, like so, science helped me to understand. The, I often ask the angels, but they didn't ask to me. You know, and um, but yeah, our air is full of stardust, so we are breathing in and out. You know, the universe. Yeah, and and that's an incredible thing. You know, we we are part and we are all connected to the whole universe and to the whole of creation. And we're connected to God because of our soul, because our soul is that spark of light of God. And, and I just say to people, it's so, so tiny, but yet so enormous. It fills every part of us, but it's out there as well. And I, I think that is... That's incredible. And that creation, I'm telling people all the time lately, because God has said, tell them, creation is still happening. So one day science will come along and we'll talk about that, that creation is still happening. But there was another thing that I see on rare occasions, you know, and I always move out of its way. And I was describing it to someone. Um, who was very scientific, is that what you that right. word, scientific? Um, I was describing this tiny little light and I was describing it in detail in the center of it and the rim on the outside and, and the way it moves, you know, it's controllable. It, it, it just doesn't come crashing down. It will move at, and I said, you know, I see it on rare occasions and it goes through everything. Initially, and, and I said, you know, you could have your ceiling here and if it passed through your ceiling and passed through steel and it passes through the earth. And this person looked at me and said, oh, you are describing what some pilots have seen. Oh, wow. Yeah, dog. Yeah. And, and they, they don't know exactly what it is, but maybe the next time, maybe. Maybe I put my hand out, but I always move out of its way. And there's always more than one. We never just see one on its own. So if I can see them and a pilot has seen them, why can't everybody see them? Like, why can't you see the angels? Why can't you see, you know, see through the tree, see the inside of the tree and see how it's working? Yeah. You know, why, why can't you, you know, see and feel all that I see and feel and hear? Yeah. You know, um, we are evolving, but I think we have to be a little bit more spiritual and all the spiritual things people want, and that's love, compassion, hope, 
you know, empathy, you know, we're looking for peace, peace in our hearts. But by the way, they're not for sale. You can't go into a shop and buy them. Right. They're not for sale. You actually have them all already. But I think the world is just through time, religion, government, so whatever, just has, in a sense, conditioned us, you know, that you're not a servant of them. But they are all those things, that pure love, because that's what that spark of light is, of God, your soul. You're connected to it. Yeah. But you can't buy it, you know, yeah. and then you want to say, I want love. I, I want to feel peace inside of me. I, I want... I want to have compassion for myself and compassion for others. I want to forgive myself so I can forgive others or, you know, but these are all the things you can't buy. They're not for sale. This is always there, but just are so easily covered up by getting distracted by other things that are less important. Yeah. And, and it is too, I, I believe, I believe this is why God has me here is to connect spiritually back to our souls, back to that light, to that power that's within us. You know, because I have been shown so many um, incredible futures. And and sometimes in the books I describe them mm -hmm. and so a bit negative. But if I describe, let's say, 10 incredible futures, that's actually one. I just break them up so so that mankind can take it in one at a time because they all come together as one. I see. So is so you're you're get so you're talking about like one one future that you're then breaking up into individual events so that it's more easy to understand rather than the whole thing yeah. happening at once. Yeah. At once. Yeah. That makes sense. It, one of the things that what well, just this perception that you're talking about is fascinating because there, there, there is a way that people can get into these states and it just, it's just, it doesn't seem to happen. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not familiar of, of other people who are able to like have it all the time. Although there's, there's stories of, especially in the East of mystics that have abilities like this, but there are ways that if that people can kind of change their state of consciousness and then they perceive things in a different way. And those like psychedelics are a, are a common example, at, at least in, in the United States that, and that's being studied quite heavily right now. And these it, it's the perceptions are very consistent with what you're describing. This, this state of like, of your, you're getting more depth and detail in the things that you're perceiving. And you, you're asking this question of why can't other people see it that way? And one of the explanations that I've seen quite a bit is that we've developed perceptually to just have shortcuts for the things that we see, because from an evolutionary perspective, we're evolving for the survival and reproduction. And, but that's not necessarily the same thing as us seeing like into the essence of things and what things actually are. But th th there are ways that, that we can change that typical, like shortcut state of consciousness to then get into a way where, where we're seeing the things in a way that you describe. Uh, has anybody, have any scientists or, or group of researchers that, I know this gets a little dangerous because they, they get quick to reduce things, but has anybody reached out to you to, to study the, How or to, to study your brain in the way you're seeing things? Well, I wouldn't let them study my brain for a start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I wouldn't allow myself to be a pincushion in, in that, in that way. But yes, lots of scientists over the years have bullished me. And one thing that they always say is that the one that we read your books and, you know, they agree, they agree with a lot of what's in the books, but they can't say anything because they would lose their credibility. Yeah. And, um, you know, and one scientist said to me, you know, what way did he put it? If, if someone says, if another scientist says to you, Lorna, you know, something is impossible, then they're not a scientist. Right. Because everything is possible, you know, um, and, and I loved, I love that. So I, I often would answer questions, um, for someone in, in that, in that line, if I know the answer, 
or if I'm being given it at that moment, but never ask me to repeat it because I can't do that, you know, in that, in that way. Um, so, so yes, in like, I, again, I use the word condition because that's the word I can say, you know, like mankind has been so, so much conditioned, you know, as you said, to see things only in one way. And you say for survival, I would say the opposite. I would say it's not for survival. I would say mankind has made that mistake. And it's like we have to reconnect again back spiritually. We're inclined to think that the past, going back maybe three or 4,000 years ago, we're inclined to think that those people back then weren't very intelligent. But you're wrong. They could have been more intelligent and way more advanced than we are today. Yeah, especially in certain ways of, of perceiving things, especially spiritually. Yeah. I mean, you look back across some of the things that they figured out thousands of years ago that we have now forgotten. And, you know, even, even, even it's, it's like we took a weird step back and we developed these basic scientific tools. And then we decided that everything else should be thrown away unless it can be proven by science. And even just now in the West, in the United States, we just recently have decided to say that meditation can be beneficial, but they've known that for thousands of years. Yes. So there's, there's, there's it's, it's very interesting thinking about some of the things that, that, that those people had figured out. And just because we've decided to take one route, one path and become, at least again, you know, I can only really speak for the country that I live in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've gotten kind of obsessed with if we can't study it scientifically, it's not real. And you talked about this thing of scientists not being able to say certain things out of fear that they lose their job. And there's, there's a lot of that over here and it's, it's a shame, but yeah, it's, it, these, these kinds of experiences are, they're, they're so interesting and it seems like we're starting to come around slowly, but, um, I, I, th I think that, that there's a lot there that, that people can learn with it if we're able to have an open mind. Well, what has it been like for you and, and trying to, to talk to people about these kinds of experiences and the insights that you get from them? What has the reception of that been like? Um, well, I, I suppose it's been half and half, yeah. you know, some absolutely, you know, very positive and all of that. And then some, you know, being very negative in that way, but to me, it doesn't matter anymore because I always said to God, you know, when angels in my hair came out, if it saved one life, my job was done, you know, yeah. and in that, in that way, that yet it seems to continue changing people's lives for the better, you know, and, and to me, that is the most important thing, you know, to be able to help another human being or nature. And, and when you were saying there, you know, and I was saying about the past, you go back thousands of years, science are still trying to figure out how yeah. come thousands of years they could uh, draw on the stars where yeah. the planets were. How could they do that? And they had no telescopes, you know, all, yeah. all of this kind of thing, how they could um, bring water from one place to another without machinery like we have today. We do it easy today, but they did it in, in a way that they just used nature, you know, and grant you it was hard work, but they made huge changes within their lives and everything like that. I think mankind was just more connected to nature in, in that way. And, and that's one thing that, you know, God and the angels have taught me is everything out of nature. And I think um, one of those famous artists that, um, you know, the universe, he done a painting of the universe. I don't know if you know that one, some very famous, there's only one painting of it. And um, I had to smile when it was pointed to me because I just turned around and said, you know, he was a seer. He was able to see. Yeah. Like 
he shouldn't have been able to do that painting and do it in the way he did it because when science looks at it they're saying how could he have done that right you know in that in that way and and then it reminded me when when i saw it oh yeah the wind the air and the wind move that way like how can i explain this scientifically um The air and the wind are both separate. Okay. And they move separately. And at times you see spinning, but nothing touches. And at times you just see, oh, what would I call it? Is like ripples and just like, but then it's all full of particles because we have so much coming in from the universe, but we have so much going out from our planet from the pollution or putting it into, into the air as well and yeah. um, it's just incredible to see and when he did that painting looking up at the universe he was seeing and going into the depths so imagine the distance he could see where mankind has shut off their eyes right but the eyes of your soul because that's a human way to explain it and um, from being able to see without a telescope. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think visual artists are like painters are a great example of, of people who have these kinds of abilities that that relate to the context of, of our conversation. They're they're able to see things in a different way, and it's not, and that's and then of course they have the technical ability to like to draw it out, but it's it starts with that that perception, and. Who, who who knows how they're how they're seeing those things? It might be visual. It might be that they're they're kind of getting a feeling and they're they're drawing it out in this way. But there there seems to be well, there's clearly abilities that we used to have that we don't have anymore. Because if you don't if you don't teach them, if you don't pass them on, we'll we'll lose them. So for me, for example, I have no idea how to navigate basically anything because I use a GPS. So like I have no idea how to get around because I just like. My phone has the little blue line. I'm like, okay, I'll just follow that. But people could, back then could sail around just looking at the stars. So there's abilities that clearly that we have or had that maybe through the development of technologies that we, we lost some of these things. And we, we don't really know what the consequences of that either are already or are going to be. To, to get people, I guess, what is your approach to help people start opening up to some of those perceptual experiences and being able to develop those skills that, that we might be able to have, but just haven't trained yet. Well, I, I think first thing I would say, you don't need to take drugs or I should call those other things. Psychedelics. Yes. Yeah, psychedelics. You don't need to, because that's false. I've met a few people that have taken psychedelics and then they tell me what spiritual experience they've had. But I would recognize it, that it was a cartoon maybe they had seen and they were, it was being repeated in, in their brain as, as such in that way. So they weren't really actually having a, a spiritual experience as such. You can have a spiritual experience without having anything. Yeah. You just have to allow yourself to see. And I, I would say it's, you know, even if you're a skeptic, you know, give yourself a chance to start to believe that there's more to life, you know, and, and that you, in a sense, are to live life to the fullest and to experience everything. But we have to experience everything in the sense of, you know, like this counter here that I'm sitting at, you know, and realize that it's alive and take time to be still, you know, and I always say to, to everyone, you know, you have a guardian angel. It's the gatekeeper of your soul. God has given you this guardian angel. You can ask this guardian angel to help you to be still, to help you to open your eyes, to see through the eyes of your soul, to, to feel, to see, to hear everything and to get those, how would I say, to hear the guidance you are being given. Your guardian angel will never give you, and neither will God, any 
anything negative that will harm or hurt you or anybody else or even nature. But mankind has got very good at, how would I say, putting those guilty feelings away. You know, we've got really good, good at that. And, and it's, it's just to start. I would just say, you know, even in the morning when you wake, you know, just remind yourself that you have a soul, that God is real and you have a guardian angel right there and you're looking for help today in any little thing and any sign that you've been given, you're asking as well for you to notice it, for you to see it. And remember, a sign is for you, for no one else. It's to give you encouragement, it's to give you hope, it's to give you belief. So I would start that way. I would start that way, you know. And I, I know here in Ireland, like we have the sanctuary now. Again, mm. that was a huge miracle. Like, I don't have money. You know, and, and again, it, it was the book Angels in My Hair affected someone's life so much and changed it and changed part of the family's life in whatever way. And they came searching for us. And eventually, after a long time, they were able to get in touch with us. And they asked, could they come over to see us? So they came over. I'm going to tell you part of the story. And they saw the farmhouse, you know, where I'm living. But it's in another book, you know, all, all that story. And again, another miracle. And in a sense, you know, turned around and said, well, what can we do for you? We'll build on some rooms. You know, we'll make this place bigger for you so you can. Because I told them of other things I did, you know, as well, separately. And they're ex extreme cases. It's where a family gets in touch with us and maybe it could be the father's dying wish to spend a day with us. So the whole family comes. You know, it, it could be anything. Um, but we were turned down in planning commission. And the other part of the miracle was one day um, my son was and the rest of the family and some friends were looking online to see was there anything they could rent, you know, even for a weekend where I could meet people and all of that. And then one of them sent this clip to my son um, saying this place is for sale as a laugh, as a joke. No, we have no money, you know, and then he showed it to me. He told me, click on, he told me what to do on my computer. And I clicked on and I got the, how would you say, a terrible shock because I saw these two pillars and this gate. That's where Archangel Michael had stood at a time when Joe was alive, when we were passing by. And he said, Lorna, you will live here one day. And, you know, I remember in the car, Joe, Joe slowing down and saying, are you all right? And I don't even know if I answered him. Maybe I said, yeah, or maybe I lifted my heart or whatever. And... That gave me a shock, seeing those two pillars on that gate. And then, of course, the far side of the pillar and the gate, you saw a little roof. And that's why I had said oh, to our going to Michael, no way we couldn't manage with Joe being sick in, in one little room, you know, in that, in that way. But then the video went on down the dusty little, little track and came to this big house, the sanctuary. And then there's another big part of that story. Can I tell you a little? Yeah. At, at different, at different times, even as a child, I was in that big house with God spiritually standing there looking out the windows. And I recognized it on the video straight away. And um, so I was in shock. I was in shock. But my son said to two, two Americans, a husband and wife, American, and said to them, 
And they just turned around and said, that's it, we're buying it. They bought it. You know, because we didn't have the money and it would have all collapsed and fallen down if, if it hadn't been bought at that particular time. The seven roofs would have fallen in. And so many other people have helped with all the repairs and everything like that. And so much more, the gardens, the forests, the rivers. And, but I always remember walking into it. And it was in very bad condition. Now, I mean, we have pictures of the condition that it was in. But going through the rooms on the, on the lower floor and the big windows, I remember exactly where I stood with God looking at. You know, so every time I go in there, and if everyone to say it feels so peaceful, but Kilfane is seemingly an Irish word, is what I was told, and translation is sacred place. You know, even even that itself, in that in that way. So, you know, how would I say spiritually, God still has me here. And I know I shouldn't be here physically. This body shouldn't be here, but it is here. And all as I want to do is do whatever God wants me to do. But I never have plans. I don't have what are, what's another word for plans? You know, I, I, plan I covers it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't do any of that. You just I let just it unfold. Go, I just let it unfold. I just go down those stepping stones and if just just let's say, and I'm always saying this to people, if if I see something that is in front of me, I don't get all emotional at all entangled because I know God could turn me before I get there. Yeah. So I it doesn't it doesn't bother me and I'd notice people would have a plan and they see what's ahead of them and if it doesn't work it's like it crushes them mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be letting things crush us because maybe you only need it to get that experience to get halfway there because you need it to go left or you right. need it to right and not to be getting yourself upset it's to trust and have faith to trust and have faith and and don't be concerned over where God is taking you, like you're, you're in college or, or you're studying, yep. yet we'll go down that road, go down whatever road is God is taking you. And if all of a sudden he turns you, that's incredible because you have all this experience now. Yeah. You know, and don't be so worried and stressed over things. You know, you're meant to as well enjoy life and live life, but you're meant to in the sense it's like every step you take, that every step matters in the world, not just for you, but for others and for nature. You know, you're not just a, a human being, you're actually a spiritual being. I know if you were in front of me here physically, I would be seeing, probably in through your body as well, but, you know, I would be seeing all the different energy all around your body you know, and, and how you react even, even how that energy reacts when you're speaking, you know, in that, in that way. So there's, we have so much to learn that maybe we have forgotten. You know, it's like, I remember doing a podcast with a lady and she said she was fascinated by everything, but Lorna, when you told me that, I thought it was incredible crazy when I told her that so I'll tell you so to Jackie Port um that in the future you know all our technology and I know I'll get into trouble over this all our technology <laughs> and we won't need it you won't need that phone you won't need this, that screen and one little description I gave was for the children cross the river without a bridge so just think of that. 
I know it's a bit, uh, at, it's fascinating. you know, it's, it is fascinating. And at the moment, mankind thinks that's impossible. Yeah. yeah. But as that scientist has said to me, not, you know, nothing is impossible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, for talking about this. It's It's been a, a pleasure exploring these ideas with you. I, I think th these experiences are so interesting and the perceptions that, that, that you have are, they're, they're, they're congruent with things that I've, I've read in, in other places. So just, it, it's, and you mentioned how science is starting to catch up and be able to, to describe some of these things. It, it's going to be very interesting in the, in the future to see how how that how that unfolds and how um how, how we just begin to learn some more about these abilities that we might be able to have um so th th thanks so much uh for coming on um thanks for the the work that, that you do and the the books that that you've written um so yeah I've, i really appreciate your time today well thank you very much for having me on your show i really enjoyed the conversation with you yeah, me too Okay, God Thank bless. You. God bless. Bye-bye.